Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Nicole Kaczynskas and Billy Sullivan? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Nicole Kaczynskas was born on June 6, 1987, and raised in Nashua, New Hampshire. This is about an hour north of Boston, Massachusetts. Her father's name was Anthony Kaczynskas, and her mother's name was Jean Domenico. Nicole had one younger brother. In 1999, Nicole's parents divorced, and Nicole decided to keep her father's last name. In May 2002, while exploring online chat rooms, Nicole met a teenager named William Sullivan Jr., who went by the name Billy. He becomes an important figure in this story. Billy had been born on March 24, 1985 in Connecticut. He was raised in the town of Willimantic. Initially, he lived with his mother, father, and several siblings. His parents had difficulty regulating their intake of alcohol and eventually divorced. When his mother was pregnant with him, she smoked cigarettes and drank at least a six-pack of beer every day. Even after finding out that she was pregnant, Billy's mother waited four months to stop drinking. Billy was born premature and had a number of difficulties when he was young. He was plagued by nightmares, asthma, and projectile vomiting. At one point, when his family was living in what they referred to as a welfare motel, Billy watched it burn down. He thought that his friends were in the motel, and this was traumatizing for him. Sometime around the age of four, Billy developed what he referred to as death thoughts. He was treated by a psychotherapist when he was about five years old. His mother pulled him out of therapy about a year later after seeing some improvement. After this, Billy introduced the idea of bringing an end to his own life. This type of thinking is rare for six-year-olds. Billy once again received counseling, but it did not seem to work as well this time. His behavior became more impulsive, and Billy took dramatic risks. For example, he would jump out of trees and off rooftops. He spent 30 days in a mental hospital where he was given prescription drugs. By the time Billy was eight years old, he had experience with a shocking number of different psychotropic medications. At various times, he was on Ritalin, Prozac, Lithium, Zoloft, Zyprexa, Risperdal, Depakote, Buspar, Clonidine, Neurontin, and Thorazine. These medications did not seem to help him enough. On one occasion, Billy attacked a respite worker with a baseball bat before using the bat to destroy his sister's bicycle. He was returned to the mental hospital. After he was released, he ended up back in the hospital almost immediately. He would be admitted to two more hospitals by the time he was 11 years old. By this point, Billy's behavior was completely out of control. He refused to participate in mental health counseling, and his behavior in school was unacceptable. He started fights, threw objects, and threatened teachers. Billy could fly into a rage at the slightest provocation, like somebody making an innocuous statement to him. His mother petitioned the state of Connecticut for a probation officer to watch Billy, which did help a little. In March 1998, Billy ran out of school and chased a truck that was driving down the road. He falsely believed the driver was his father. School employees caught up with him and convinced him to return to the school. After he did this, he started kicking and screaming. He was taken to a mental hospital and injected with Haldol. Billy would be in and out of the hospital several times after this. Eventually, he managed to improve his behavior a little bit. He performed better in school and found a job as a line cook at McDonald's. Now moving back to the relationship between Nicole and Billy. As I mentioned, they met online in May 2002. At this time, Nicole was 14 and Billy was 17. Nicole and Billy frequently communicated through the internet, on the phone, and using letters. Within a few days of meeting, 
they professed their undying love for each other and talked about marriage. In August 2002, Nicole's mother, Jean, drove Nicole to see Billy for the first time. The teenage lovers would go on to see each other a few more times in the following months. Nicole asked her mother about moving in with Billy. Jean rejected that idea. Nicole then talked about getting legally emancipated. Jean was not on board with this idea either, but the couple was still determined to find a way to be together forever. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On August 1, 2003, Billy arrived at Jean's house with the intent of staying for a week. This was something Jean allowed, but she was concerned about potential romantic activity occurring between the teenage lovers. By this time, Billy was 18 years old and Nicole was 16. There was even more talk about the young couple living together. They wanted to get their own apartment. After giving their situation some thought, Nicole and Billy decided that their best course of action was to murder Jean. During this week when Billy was visiting, the teenage couple made four unsuccessful attempts to kill Nicole's mother. They put Benadryl, ibuprofen, and Dimetap in her coffee creamer. When that failed, they put bleach in the coffee creamer, but Jean simply threw it away without consuming it. The young couple used a candle and tried to set the blanket on Jean's bed on fire. They could not get the blanket to burn. Their last unsuccessful attempt involved an effort to blow up Jean's house. They bought a rope, like the type that might be used for a clothesline, poured gasoline on it, and put the rope in the oil tank in the basement of Jean's house. The idea was that the rope would function as a fuse. They would light the rope, it would burn all the way down into the oil tank, and the house would explode. The plan was abandoned after the young couple was interrupted by Jean's boyfriend. On August 6, 2003, one day before Billy was supposed to go back to Connecticut, he and Nicole implemented a more direct plan. They parked a vehicle at a 7-Eleven convenience store not far from Jean's house. As Nicole waited in the vehicle, reading a magazine, Billy made his way to the house. 43-year-old Jean was there alone after arriving home from work a few moments earlier. Her son was at a friend's house. After talking with Jean for a few minutes, Billy attacked her with a baseball bat. He retrieved a knife from the kitchen and stabbed her, but the knife broke. Billy then retrieved a second knife, and continued stabbing her. Jean sustained over 40 stab wounds. She did not survive. Billy ran to the vehicle at the 7-Eleven store where Nicole was and told Nicole to get him a towel. He wanted to clean up because he was covered in blood. She made her way to Jean's house and retrieved the towel and part of a knife that Billy accidentally left behind. Nicole stepped over her mother's body in the process. The teenage couple disposed of incriminating evidence in various locations before going to a mall to buy Billy new clothing. Sometime after 7 p.m., Jean's boyfriend arrived at her house and discovered her body. She was not responsive, and there was blood all over the kitchen. He immediately called 911. At around 10.15 p.m., when the police were still at the crime scene, Nicole and Billy returned to the house. They were transported to a police station and questioned separately. Not long after this, they both confessed to the murder and told the police where they had disposed of the incriminating evidence. They were charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. On March 28, 2005, Nicole pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 40 years in prison with the opportunity to have her sentence reduced by five years if she completed an educational program in prison. In July 2005, Billy was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Jean Domenico was described as rugged, frugal, and highly committed to her daughter Nicole. A lot of tension was introduced into their relationship after Billy entered the picture. Jean tried to set boundaries with her daughter, but Jean kept giving in to her daughter's requests. Jean was trying to allow Nicole to have some freedom without placing her in danger. 
Jean assumed that if she allowed her daughter to have contact with Billy, Nicole would grow to dislike him or get bored with him. Nicole would then move on and find someone better. When that didn't happen, Jean came to believe that it was too late to stop Nicole's relationship with Billy. I think what happened here is that Jean was just tired of fighting. Surrendering to Nicole's wishes was the path of least resistance. In a strange twist, due to prior bad experiences, Jean was extremely afraid of knives. For a long time, she didn't have any in her house, but was later convinced to overcome her fear and keep some in the kitchen. Item number two, Nicole was a troubled teenager who struggled with feelings of depression. She did not have any friends and was described as shy, having a dark side, and being fascinated with ghosts. Nicole thought of herself as overweight and ugly. When she first communicated with Billy, he told her that she was attractive. He said she was a goddess who came down to earth to make some lucky guy's life change. Nicole was highly receptive to receiving this type of compliment. She came to believe that no one understood her like Billy, and she could not be happy without him. Nicole viewed her life with her mother as horrible and the cause of constant suffering. She believed that God sent Billy so she could tolerate her, quote, life of hell, unquote. Every time Jean failed to maintain a boundary, Nicole became more determined to have a life with Billy. At one point, Nicole was running up $500 to $1,000 phone bills. Jean was unable or unwilling to control Nicole's behavior. Nicole's obsession was powerful and all-consuming. During the 15-month relationship between Nicole and Billy, they had only seen each other in person four or five times. This caused tension to build up and allowed time for fantasies to be repeatedly entertained, explored, and modified. Nicole waited in a vehicle as Billy committed the murder, but she was an active participant. Right before the murder, as Billy was in the house talking to Jean and trying to work up the nerve to strike, Nicole called him and urged him to commit the homicide immediately. She was tired of waiting. Item number three, Billy had a terrible childhood and had several mental health difficulties. Clinicians for the defense suggested that Billy was unable to regulate his impulses and had borderline personality features. He was legally insane when he committed the murder. Clinicians for the state, of course, disagreed. They pointed out how Billy had tried to kill Jean four times before achieving success. This is not the behavior of a person who acted impulsively. After being arrested, Billy wrote letters to a 15-year-old girl and told her that he was innocent. He promised that they could be together, but she needed to do him a favor so he could be released. He asked the girl to convince Nicole to lie when she testified against him. This incident supported the argument that Billy was manipulative and knew exactly what he was doing. Now moving to my final item, number four. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. This case involved a confluence of personality traits and behaviors, which led to disaster. Nicole was depressed, lonely, and had low self-esteem. She was desperately searching for someone to save her. Her mother, Jean, did not know how to set boundaries after Nicole experienced intense emotions and desires. Billy was a dangerous teenager with a long history of rage and violence. Nicole and Billy had adult urges, which were processed through a childlike understanding of how the world functioned. They implemented ridiculous murder attempts, like trying to ignite heating oil to blow up a house. It's like they were getting their ideas from the Wild E. Coyote homicidal handbook. Eventually, they came up with a more effective tactic. This case featured three people who inaccurately evaluated those around them. To Nicole, her mother was a demon and Billy was an angel. From Jean's perspective, her daughter was a troubled teenager and Billy was a nuisance. To Billy, Jean was an obstacle and Nicole was the love of his life. In reality, Jean was a mother who did the best that she could under challenging circumstances. Nicole was a sadistic and callous teenager who killed her greatest ally, and Billy was an impulsive and violent offender 
who appeared to be destined to commit murder. Those are my thoughts in the case of Nicole Kaczynskis and Billy Sullivan. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.